Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, our discussion is with Polish Humanitarian Action, um, an organization that is dedicated to advancing humanitarian, action, humanitarian actions in and outside of uh, Poland, and that is doing quite a bit to help Ukrainian refugees. My special guest today is Gzegasz Grusa. Uh, Zegosh, thank you so much. Uh, and and again, I do apologize for my very poor uh, Polish pronunciation. So um, thank you. No, no problem. That's that's is a difficult language. Polish is a difficult language. Well, and, but but a wonderful people. Tell me a little bit about the organization that you represent and uh, its founding and and the work that you did prior to this conflict, and, and then let's talk about how you were positioned to actually jump in when this conflict that is over 100 uh, days old uh, uh, started. Uh, Polish humanitarian uh, action was established nearly 30 years ago. It was a very specific time for Poland, for, for Europe. Uh, we were having uh, just uh, a year before uh, first uh, almost free elections. Uh, and the Communist Party has uh, has lost its power. Uh, so, um, and soon after that, uh, the war in, in former Yugoslavia uh, broke out. And uh, we, as, as Poles, we were still uh, having in mind the times where Poland was receiving a lot of humanitarian assistance from all over the world during the, the martial law. Uh, that was uh, in Poland established in um, after the solidarity movement was uh, was uh, delegized uh, was was not able to work anymore. So uh, as as I say, my my generation still remembers receiving the fi- famous yellow cheese from from USA, food, medicines, clothing, everything that was basically lacking in, in Poland and at this time we were uh, the receiving from all over the world. So we were beneficiaries of that kind of assistance. So once we, we felt that uh, Poland can be also supporting uh, places like, like Yugoslavia, our founder, Janina Hojska, who, who learned how uh, the, uh, the assistance is being organized by staying in France um, when she was there as a, as a student, also go undergoing some surgery. When she got involved in that, and and then with the French organization, actually came to Poland and became responsible for coordinating the the aid that was coming to Poland. Um, also, there was a question from the French organization whether Poles could organize a convoy to to Sarajevo, and then Janina said, "Yes, uh, well, we, we we can try," and she did it. No one really believed that uh, in a country there uh, that was fairly poor at that time, uh, there will be so much solidarity in 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 the in the society that people would give their trucks, give their money, give food, and practically um, supply the whole convoy uh, of several trucks. And uh, the thing that's the thing yeah. that's so important and impressive is if we go back a little bit in history, right? Poland was occupied in 39 by the Germans, then in the aftermath of the Second World War, was occupied by the Russians and became a Russian satellite state. When the Soviet Union fell, Poland went through this incredible transition. And as you said, was quite um, uh, economically depressed. Um, And since the the, uh, reestablishment of democracy um, has evolved considerably. But what what is interesting about what you've done is that in the United States, when you have a nonprofit organization functioning, you get a tax deduction to make contributions. It's, It's very much encouraged. In Poland, what you basically did is you saw a need outside of Poland. It wasn't about you. It was about other people who were engaged in the same struggles that you had been engaged in and normal citizens, as you said, right, got in their cars, got in their trucks, assembled means. And I don't want to I don't want to make it into something that is uh, too mythological, but it really came from a human impetus to just do something, to try and pass on 
to others what the benefits that you had received from others. And that's that's a really important point that that informed by each person's history, you can take that history and convert it into good for others. And, and that's the story that you're telling. Yes, and even now with the uh, situation in Ukraine, um, as I, uh, a lot of people is uh, that are not organizations that are private people uh, do the same. They, uh, you know, uh, organize some 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 food, organize some some health uh, uh, medicines, and they get in a truck and they go to a certain city uh, where they have friends or where they have people that were supporting them with the distribution. And the scale of this is really uh, incredible. It's it's uh, going out of hands to that point that sometimes the uh, on the borders the line of cars that are carrying in humanitarian assistance is longer than the one that is carrying uh, commercial goods. So uh, this this gives you only the, the scale of, of the amount. We alone were able to uh, deliver food parcels, uh, health uh, parcels uh, with medicines uh, to over uh, almost 200,000 people uh, just in a couple months. So, uh, and we are organized, we are, uh, let's say, professional in, in, in organization that, as you mentioned, uh, for now almost 30 years, is uh, delivering humanitarian assistance through all the major conflicts and natural disasters. So we've been in places like, um, uh, of course, Afghanistan, uh, but also uh, Haiti after the, well, we've been even able to assist one of the schools after Katrina to rebuild their uh, uh, their classrooms in United States. So that's a, that's an interesting You're story. You're basically going where there is need. Uh, Zagash, let me ask you a, a, a question. Um, when we see this war being prosecuted, and uh, places like shopping centers being bombed and railheads where civilians are gathering. I mean, that is basically a strategy to um, disincentivize and make very dangerous this type of civilian activity, right? When, when, you're, when you're basically um, randomly attacking uh, different places that can be conduits, roads and so on, in, in the interior of, of, of uh, the country. Um, you're basically sending a message to the philanthropic people of Poland, as well as to the military suppliers, don't support Ukrainians. Um, how, do your, how does your group deal with that inevitable fear that is part of this uh, conflict that is being perpetrated. Um, how do you talk internally about your own safety as you go into these conflict zones? Well, uh, first of all, fear is something good. Fear makes you vigilant, makes you aware. And uh, this is, uh, I usually say that the moment when someone tells me that I'm not afraid, I will go everywhere you want me to go. It's the moment you shouldn't be going anywhere. But okay, that's in, in a way. But on the other hand, we are, of course, trained. We are prepared for that kind of, we are uh, equipped with all the, uh, you know, life vests and all the, uh, all the equipment. Life, that life and those kinds of things. Yes, this is essential to our, to our work. Uh, and then, uh, of course, we get security trainings. We have security officers, people that are taking care of our uh, of our security. And this is also required by the all big international donors. They basically, if they are giving uh, funds to our organization, the organization has to be professionally prepared to meet that kind of uh, danger. But on a personal level, this is always uh, your your own choice. And you know that you are going there with, with uh, the assistance that you are providing to the people that don't have a choice. They are there. Some of them can leave, some of them cannot. And so if, if not us, who else is going to do the job? How do you uh, get, assemble the resources required? You, you refer to some international aid, but how do you, how do you fund, fund the, the work that you do? And this is something that we've been able to develop uh, from the very beginning. We believe that uh, even if we would be like, it could happen now that we are only depending on uh, official donations from, from, let's say, uh, governmental agencies or others, it's 
always important that the Polish society and now also international society uh, will be supporting our uh, action because without this support, uh, this is just a technical issue. Uh, you, you buy, you ship, you distribute. But uh, when you have this uh, involvement, and as we had, uh, for example, a huge concert at the beginning of the war, when people were sending uh, funds uh, in really big, uh, big uh, amounts, also private businesses, corporations are getting uh, involved, and then it's their uh, their case. Then they understand that this is. Uh, we are just uh, the ones that are facilitating, that are delivering. But people uh, understand that this is their role to help others. So this is this is a, a full-on societal response. You have governments, of course. Uh, you have businesses. You have individual businesses. You have individual citizens. And some people are contributing their labor and other people are contributing their wealth. Um, in terms of the infrastructure that you have and the personnel that you have, how are you organized? Are you are you solely located in Poland or are, are there other uh, areas of the country where you have offices? Well, this is very, uh, very, a very crucial uh, question because we for many years, well, as I say, in Ukraine, we are from the very beginning of the of the conflict. Right. So it's uh, but usually we operate through permanent missions, permanent presence in countries where we establish our office. And then we work with local organizations, local civil society that are uh, in support of us with uh, local uh, also volunteers. So we have a permanent presence in the countries. And we are also present in countries like Yemen, uh, South Sudan, Somalia. So they are not easy places. We are used to going to wars. Right. Uh, and being in, in very, very difficult places. But now as we look at the Ukrainian conflict, it's a conflict that's affecting not only Ukraine, Poland, or other countries in, in Europe, and not to mention uh, the Russian people uh, as, as they are under the sanctions, uh, but it affects Africa in a very bad manner. If the, uh, uh, the resources cannot leave Ukraine, if the grain will not reach Africa, we'll have famine of a scale that we have uh, haven't seen uh, for probably uh, never or uh, at least uh, uh, many many years uh, maybe biafra was the case is this part of the war strategy in your estimation that is being pursued uh, by, uh, by uh, well it, 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 we've been present uh, in chechnya so we know how how the war um, works in 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 Russia. So Chechnya is, is there, there were three there have been three major conflicts uh, the, the the Chechen conflict, the Georgian conflict, and the Syrian conflict. Um, and and they've all, been, they've all had commonalities, been. haven't they? Exactly. As as we look at it, it's just the scale that is, and the proximity of the conflict is something new for us. But otherwise. The operations of modus operandi is just the same, so it's it's nothing new. And sometimes I'm I'm wondering why the the Western countries are uh, somehow shocked by what is happening in Ukraine. It was happening before; everyone could see it, and it was it is nothing new. Uh, of course, now the scale is much bigger, uh, and the fact that it is happening in Europe uh, and it is actually happening next door to us, this is something uh, that is new. And of course, the magnitude of the influx of, of uh, refugees and IDPs is, is just uh, incredible. And if we can mention that uh, almost 3 million people are in Poland, oh, some of them are leaving and coming back, but the majority uh, is, is still in Poland. When Poland has about 37 million people, uh, please imagine, you can imagine that uh, I have a family uh, in my house, many people, and we don't have huge refugee uh, camps in Poland. People were accommodated by Poles and they are staying with their families in spite of the fact that practically the official assistance for the family is, is phasing out. Uh, well, we will be doing it because uh, they are our neighbors, and, and it's a it's a it's a way that we we decided to do. Of course, it's becoming more and more difficult for the families, especially with the economic crisis and and the prices of fuel and everything. This right. is becoming complicated for all of us. 
Well, this is this is the point, right? I mean, we are in wartime, but only a part of the world feels um, it is immediately affected. Your part of the world is immediately affected. You you have a a home now where your privacy is not what it was because you are hosting a a, a um, you're hosting others, mm-hmm. and then all your costs go up. All of your discretionary activities are impacted. Um, in terms of of the attitudes of yourself and, and fellow Poles, I know that it's it's incredibly stressful. Is do you feel like there is is uh, again a purposeful ratcheting up of that stress with the objective of creating um, a lack of patience now and a lack of hospitality over time? Because I, I don't see this this conflict ending uh this year, I don't expect it to end in, in in a couple of years. I expect this to go on for a long time. How do you see it? See it? I'm, af- I'm afraid you're right. Uh, and as, as we see, as we look at it from the perspective of the n- n- previous eight, uh, almost nine years now, uh, it may it may go on like that. I mean, uh, right. the resources uh, on the other side still are there. You can you can keep the the country in a, in a deadlock. You can you can once in a while send uh, several missiles to hit uh, a mall or other places, and you will uh, people will live in fear. Uh, the ones that have uh, some prospects probably will leave, which will also uh, additionally weaken the, the 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 social structure of of the uh, people educated, knowing languages. They might just decide that this is. Not a place to live anymore, and this is something that we'll uh, we'll have to we'll have to deal with, and we will have to prepare as as we were saying uh, from the very beginning, as we know how the, the humanitarian crisis unfolds in many places of the world. That this is not a it's not a sprint. It's not it's a long run. It's a long march that we will we have to uh, face, and I hope that international community, our donors. Uh, and polls will be able to uh, uh, commit to such such uh, activity, and that we can uh, start to function in this n- new uh, reality. Uh, and of course, if I can tell you, uh, only in Warsaw, in order to accommodate the amount of uh, children and students that are came with their mothers to, to to Poland, we need to build seven new schools. In the city of million, million just, two million just people. one, just one city as large as Warsaw yes. is. That's seven new schools, and that's just to accommodate not natural growth, but just to accommodate a in, an influx of refugees. Yeah. yeah. So in terms of, uh, in terms of, uh, let's get back to to the types of work that you do. You actually do a whole range of different activities. You're supplying immediate needs. You're supplying food. You're supplying medical needs and so on, but you're also countering, for example, the threat of human trafficking, which, uh, you know, during in war zones, you have um, a modern version of the the slave trade, often um, perpetrated against women and young girls. You have uh, slave labor that that, uh, that occurs. Uh, Talk a little bit about the various groups of activities that you engage in. not only not only in Ukraine and in, and for refugees, but also around the world. What types of support do you provide? Yes, well, in this conflict, this was one of the primary issues because, as as you know, probably the ninety seven percent of of refugees are uh, women and children. So from the very 97 97 yes. percent, and that's ninety seven percent of over. I think it's over 3 million people. Yes, yes, yes it's over 3 million. Well, we, we don't really know the uh, the perfect numbers because at the peak of the of, of the war, there were 150,000 people crossing the border daily. So uh, even uh, just a minute, a minute and a half was uh, the process to put someone into the system when they were crossing the border. Right. Uh, but going back to your question, uh, the, 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 the issue of, of human trafficking, uh, we have set up uh, so-called accommodation centers or information centers at the main borders where we work together with our uh, partners. Uh, the, there is a, 
uh, well-established Polish organization internationally also uh, operating La Strada. And they would be receiving leaflets, they would be receiving information, we would have a psychologist and the place. So once they crossed the border, they were sensitized about the uh, potential threats that they can meet. But still, uh, people were coming, uh, private people were coming by cars uh, and taking people home. So you, you, there, were no, there was no way to uh, make sure that nothing bad will happen. Still, probably uh, the scale was very small. There were probably some cases that, that happened. But by, uh, by sensitizing people, by uh, uh, giving them the, the knowledge about the uh, potential threat, uh, I think we, we, but also other organizations that are on the border, um, then uh, IOM, International Organization of Migration, arrived with their own people, with their, their own stands. You know, you're making a you're making a very good point, right? In the initial phases where humans are responding to humans, the likelihood of exploitation is there. You have to talk about it, but the reality is not very high. But as things become more systematic, then the exploiters also organize. They also have an expectation of where people are coming in, and they can start organizing in a way that is become becomes a lot more threatening to these women and girls, and and that needs to be countered in a very systematic way. So what you're what you're saying is is that you've had to adjust over time in different phases of this of this catastrophe. Yeah, well, then institutions come in, and then they. Uh... They gradually take on uh, the, the 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 message, then they also supervise some procedures and and are able to to prevent those kind of things. But uh, but you, you know the the scale was just so tremendous. But even then, people on the railway stations, police were were sensitized to make sure. But at the other hand, we we are we were supporting, for example, a group of uh, taxi drivers from Portugal that came. Uh, with an organization and were taking people uh, to Portugal. Uh, and, and it was probably the first time in the history that once you, you pass the Polish-Ukrainian border, you could end up in Lisbon uh, without any checks, without any you know procedures. You, you could just become uh, uh, ch ch choose to, to go to wherever you, the, the, the so-called open Europe uh, um, really uh, worked in, in the first place. Uh, and people, uh, to some to some extent, were able to if they had families or they have relatives or someone who could come and pick them up. Uh, many people decided also to leave. Some are trying still to get to U.S. Some are trying to get to Canada. But uh, uh, the unpredictability of the situation is something that is driving really a lot of frustration also in in the uh, uh, refugee population that is in Poland, because people really don't know what to do, uh, what, whether to stay in Poland or to go back to, to, uh, to Ukraine. And with children, uh, this is always a, a choice of whether they should go to school in Poland. For the first period, uh, children were mainly online, which is up probably one of the profits of, of COVID. Uh, but uh, I had, a, 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 with, with me, there was a girl that was studying medicine and she was online and she went back to Ukraine to give her exams now. So, yeah, what, so you're, what, you're, what you're describing is very interesting. People talk about the benefits of organization, right? That, that things are organized and organization has its place, but disorganization also has its place, just responding to need. Is that part of, uh, of how you operate, that you see a need and you function as first responders? You basically see the need, you galvanize action, and it might be disorganized. It might be not the most efficient thing, you might have taxi drivers coming from Portugal and then driving people back, which is a terribly inefficient way to do things, but it is immediate. It is fast, right? Is that is that part of what you're doing is that you're basically trying to see a problem and identifying it and, and solve it all at the same time without necessarily uh, being so organized about it because you don't have time to organize? Uh, we call it the needs-based approach. And this is uh, the, the way that we uh, operate, that we have in our DNA. 
And uh, it's, it's quite often, and we've seen it in many places before, uh, after the tsunami, uh, we were in Sri Lanka. Sometimes the aid that is being delivered is completely uh, not uh, needed in, 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 the, in the place. So it's always better to assess the need first, be aware of the needs, and not to project your ideas about the needs of people that are in, in the moment at the moment uh, needing something. Sometimes you wouldn't you wouldn't come up with with solutions that uh, you may uh, uh, be aware once you do your assessments. Once you you, you ask people, uh, you uh, aggregate the, the data, then you can really, uh, as we are doing now. Uh, we are uh, delivering assistance in the form of uh, multi-purpose cash assistance, which is recognized by, by uh, all international donors and everyone as the most effective, because once the person receives money, he knows best what to do. And then you get uh, uh, out of the way all the logistics of uh, warehousing, sending, storing, the, the, the free market do that for you. Uh, so if people uh, prefer to eat potatoes instead of, uh, of, of uh, pasta, they will buy potatoes. And we are not deciding for them uh, what, what to eat or what kind of medicine they need. That is so important. You know, from the very beginning, I want to I want to point out to to our viewers and listeners that um, PAH established its first permanent mission in Kosovo and Chechnya. And there you were dealing with um, with access to safe drinking water and sanitary facilities. Um, and you have talked about the need to provide educational support. You've talked about the logistics of moving Europe. You've talked about uh, providing uh, medical aid. Uh, it is really a a really astounding, astounding range of services that you in real time it's it it, it, it and and um it is it is great to know that goods to cash flexible in how you respond to these needs um i'm going to give you the last word because we're coming to the end of our time in terms of of all help um so because so, uh uh, um, if you were to give a, a piece of advice on how we can help you, what would that be? Well, um, well, talking about uh, the, the resources, I think, uh, again, uh, money is the best uh, way to assist in terms of uh, flexibility. You can, uh, sometimes the situation changes in a day. And uh, you, will, you would be thinking that uh, tomorrow I will be uh, delivering water and then uh, the next day it's, it's more important to deliver medicines. So by having this possibility to respond to the need, I think uh, we, we gain this, this opportunity to, to really uh, uh, be with the people and respond to their uh, basic uh, and most profound needs. Uh, we're, we're going to make sure that we uh, publish uh, where people can donate. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Gzegash uh, Gusa. Thank you. thank you for sharing the work that you're doing. Thank you for doing the work. You are really, you and your, you, your, your friends and your colleagues are so admirable, and we wish to emulate you and, um, and uh, praise you. Uh, we very much appreciate your sharing the experiences that you have with us. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Stay, stay safe. Take care.